This board is now programmed. It has the code on the flash. It's running standalone, and we're ready to take this out and put it in the lathe. Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. As you know, I am in the middle of developing an electronic lead screw for my lathe, which is a device that replaces the change gears with an electronic controller and a motor. As I've been publishing these videos, I've been getting lots of questions about how to program the TI microcontroller board that I'm using. So today we're gonna to take a closer look at that. We'll walk through the entire process of setting up the development tools, downloading the firmware from GitHub, and programming it into the microcontroller. This is the way the Launchpad board comes packaged from TI. This is specifically a 28004X model. The exact model number is Launch XL F280049C. Now in the box, you get some literature. Uh, it comes with a pinout guide. This is really handy. I highly recommend keeping this uh, handy as you're working with these boards. There is actually a version of this that's in the reference manual as well, so if you prefer that or prefer to have it in a PDF, that's available. Some terms and conditions, and then the board itself in a static shielding bag. Now, I've already cracked this one open because I was measuring it to design some mounts for DIN rails, and you'll see those later. Also in the box, it comes with a USB cable. Uh, I personally have lots of these lying around, and so probably won't be using that. Now the Launchpad board itself is designed to be as flexible as possible for lots of different applications. It's got a ton of GPIO pins broken out, uh, and it's also got some level shifters and connectors down here for the encoders. We will be using those. It's also got a connector for CAN bus for like automotive applications or other um, controller area network applications. We won't be using that. And then there's lots of switches to configure all of the extra hardware, including the encoder inputs and the debug probe that's on board. And with this debug probe, there's a power supply module and a set of optocouplers that allow you to run this potentially in a high voltage environment with the USB debug completely isolated electrically from everything else on the board. So before we use this, we've got to set up a few things. First thing we have to do is configure it so that it will use the encoder pins and not the GPIOs. The switches here on the board allow you to configure all of these peripherals that are on here and control which GPIOs are connected to the external peripheral pins and which ones are just passed through to the GPIO. And in this case, we need to change a couple of switches to enable the uh, quadrature encoder that we're gonna use. Now, the switches that we need to change are specifically S4 right here and S3 right here. Now these come with capped on tape over the top of the switches just so that they, you don't get um, solvent in it when, it's do, when they do the wash down after soldering. So that has to be removed. You can just grab it with a pair of tweezers and peel it off. I said you can just grab it with a pair of tweezers and peel it off. Okay, that's the tape off of S4. Let me peel the tape off of S3 here. Okay, I did not expect that to be the most difficult part of this process, but it was. Now S4 needs to be switched towards the USB connector, that's towards the dot. I'll switch that, and then S3 is a double switch, and it needs to be, they both need to be switched the opposite direction away from the USB connector. So that's it for the switches. Now, on the other end here, we have the voltage isolation jumpers. Now, the USB comes in here, and there it provides five volt power, 
and data. So the data goes through this optocoupler to the debug probe. So no matter what happens, the data is not connected electrically to the microcontroller. It's isolated, but the power by default is connected. And we don't want to run it in this configuration. We want to isolate it. So what's going on with these power jumpers? This is a rough schematic of the board. We've got the main power domain of the board that has the microcontroller and the debug probe. That is separated by these three jumpers and an opto isolator from the USB circuitry. So the USB connectors on the side of the board, the data goes through the optocoupler, so it's always connected to the debug probe, but it's electrically isolated. And then you get to choose whether you have the power connected. Now normally, all three of these jumpers are installed. So the ground wire from the USB goes straight through, the five volt wire from the USB goes straight through, and then there's a 3.3 volt regulator that then produces a 3.3 volt supply, and that's connected through. But that's not how we want to actually run it. We're going to have a daughter board that's going to go on here, and the five volt and ground, the power is going to be provided through that daughter board. It's going to have a regulator for 3.3 volts, so it's going to provide five volts and 3V3 and ground to the microcontroller. So we want to make sure that the power from the USB is disconnected. So we'll be running off of the power from the interface board and we can still connect the USB and debug because the data is connected through the opto isolator, but we want these disconnected. The one thing that you really want to avoid is having power from two sides. You don't want to be providing the 3V3 power externally through this regulator and also through the regulator off of the USB so that they are competing with each other. You want to choose one or the other. If you want to run off the USB, that's fine. Leave the jumpers on but we're gonna be providing the power from an external card in this case, so I'm gonna take all three of these jumpers off. Uh, one thing to note is if you're using the PC board once I make that available, it has a three volt regulator on it. So if you try to leave these on and provide power from the USB, the five volt power is gonna flow into here, it's gonna flow out to this card, go through this regulator and come back through and compete with the three volt regulator here. So if this card is on, you have to disconnect at least the three volt jumper. I recommend disconnecting all of them and just powering the whole circuit from this daughter board. So I will pull off all three of these jumpers. And then I'm just gonna put them on the side here, just on one of the pins so they're not making connection. And that way they won't get lost. And if I ever need to reconnect them, I have them handy. Okay, that's it for configuring the board. Let's take it into the computer and load some software on it. This is a brand new fresh install of Windows 10 with all of the patches applied. And in fact, it's a virtual machine and I prefer to set up my software development environments in virtual machines. That way I can have a separate virtual machine for each project that I'm working on or each different tool chain. Uh, sometimes I work in Windows, sometimes I work in Linux. In this particular case, I'm going to do this development in Windows, even though the tools are available for Linux and Mac OS. This VM is in Oracle VirtualBox, and because we're going to be connecting an external USB device, I've already gone into the device's USB settings menu, and I have added a filter that matches all devices so that any USB device I plug into the host machine will automatically be connected to the VM. If you're setting up the tools on a regular machine, you won't have to worry about this at all. So the one thing I have installed on this machine already is Chrome, and we will just go to the ti.com page for this particular microcontroller. This is the Launch XL F280049C. And this is their product page, and they've got uh, lots of links from here to documentation, information about the product, where you can buy it. And if you scroll down under software features, it has a link for the free download of what's called Code Composer Studio IDE. IDE stands for Integrated Development Environment. I will click on that. And this is the Code Composer Studio page. And if we scroll down, there's a download button. And I will scroll down to version nine. This is the one that I'm using right now with the electronic lead screw. It's the most current. And in fact, the most current release as of today is 9.1.0 build 10. And I will click on the link for Windows 64 bit only. And it will start the download. 
This is about uh, 900 megabytes because there's lots of files involved. And we'll just let that download and I will come back when it is done. Okay, the download's done. We have a zip file. I will click on it to open and go to the Extract tab and click Extract All. And click Extract. Now this is just going to extract all the files out of the zip into a directory in my download directory. And that way I can run the installer and it can access all of its files. Now the extract is done and it's automatically opened the extracted folder. Double click on the included directory and here's the installer, CCS Setup Win64. And I will just double click to run that. This is the user account control asking me if I really want to trust this. Verified publisher Texas Instruments. And yes, I do. And the splash screen comes up. I'll close these other windows. Now, the first thing it gives me is a warning that I'm running antivirus software because, of course, I'm running antivirus software and no TI, I'm not going to disable it to try to make your installer work better. Click continue. There's a license agreement next and it's asked me for the install folder i'm just going to take the default it installs it under slash ti right at the root of the c drive and because this has a lot of files and a lot of deep directories i'm just going to go with that and then the next page wants me to select processor support now i could install everything but i'm just going to install the support for c2000 real-time mcus because that's the that's what's on this board click next and it's wanting me to select which debug probe support I want to install. This first one, TI XDS debug probe, that's what's on this board is an XDS 110. So that's already checked. I'll just leave it and click finish. I get a Windows firewall question about whether I want to give this access to the network. I do. So I'll click allow access. And then just let the installer run. I won't make you wait. I'll speed this up or cut to the end and I'll be back when the install's finished. And that is the installer complete. I will let it launch Code Composer Studio and create a desktop shortcut. Click finish. And it's starting up. Okay, the first thing that it wants to know when it starts up is where I want to have my workspace. It's suggesting my user directory slash workspace v9. That's fine. I'll go ahead and click launch. It's asking me again if I want to allow the uh, Node.js server-side JavaScript to have access to the network. I do, so I'll click allow. And we now have Code Composer Studio version 9 up and running. Now I'm going to take a snapshot of the VM. This is one of the great things about the virtual machine. I'll take a snapshot now so that if I screw something up later, I can always come back to it. They're not just for scam baiting. Okay, now that we have Code Composer Studio installed, we need to get the files for the electronic lead screw firmware. This is the folder that it created, Users Cloud Workspace V9, and there are a few files already in here but I'm going to go get the source code for the electronic lead screw and drop it into this directory. I'm going to go out to GitHub and this is cloud42 slash electronic lead screw. There will be a link in the video description and this is the GitHub page for the firmware. There's a bunch of instructions here and a place where you can download the code. Now there are two ways to do this. If you're familiar with GitHub and you're familiar with Git software development, you can see that there are multiple branches in the repository and the main development is occurring on master. I've got another branch here that's for some development that's not ready yet, but the main code is on master and you can always come over here to clone or download, open that up and you can click download zip to download a current snapshot of the firmware exactly as it is today. Unless you're trying to do active development or unless you're trying to work with the very latest bleeding edge stuff, I wouldn't recommend that. Instead, I would click here where it says one release in the future, there will be more than one. Click on that. And this is a set of releases that I packaged up specifically for people to download. Right now, there's only one experimental version 1003. 
And as it says, this stuff is still experimental. So if you're throwing this on a machine and using it, just understand that that's great. You want to contribute changes or suggestions. That's great. More stable versions with more safety features will be coming in the future. Down here under assets, click to open that. And I want to download the source code as a zip file. Just click and that will download. Now click to open it. And inside it is this electronic lead screw 103. And I will just drag and drop that out into my workspace directory. And Windows will automatically unpack it there. So now under my workspace V9, I have electronic lead screw 1003. You look inside it and you see all the files that are in the GitHub project, including all of the source code. So now we'll go back to Code Composer Studio and go to File, Open Projects from File System. And it wants an import source. I will click Directory and we will browse for that directory. So C, Users, Cloud, Workspace V9, Electronic Lead Screw 1003. Select that folder and it's found the top level directory and it's found the firmware, which is this ELS-F280049C. And I will just click finish. And now we have opened it. I'll go ahead and close the getting started window so we don't have to look at that. And the project is right here, ELS-F280049C. Click on that. It's marked as active and I can see all the source code here if I expand it. Now that we have the project imported into Code Composer Studio, let's talk a moment about build configurations. You can see this says active debug. And what that means is that we have the debug build configuration active. And this is the active project because I've clicked on it. Now up here on the toolbar, there's a little hammer icon and the hammer stands for build. And if I click the arrow next to it to open it, I see that I have two build configurations, debug and release. And this just controls how the code is going to be built, whether it's optimized for debugging with lots of extra information in the code. It'll be a little bit bigger. It won't run quite as fast, but it will be easier to debug. Things will happen as you expect. The code will get executed in the order that it's actually shown in the source file, which makes it easier to follow what's going on if you're trying to solve a problem. Or you can select the release configuration in the release configuration, a lot of the additional data that's used for debugging will be removed from the code, which will make it smaller. And it will also be optimized to run faster. Sometimes uh, instructions where the order doesn't matter, they'll be run in a different order, or instructions that don't ever get run will be dropped out completely. Or the compiler can do other things to make the code run faster, but it's often a little bit more difficult to debug. So I'm going to start with the debug configuration. And if I just click on the hammer icon, we'll see the compile window come up down here and a bunch of commands go scrolling by and it's compiling the software and producing the actual output file that can be programmed to the board. And it says build finished and everything was successful. If we want to do the D or the release version, we can pull this down, select release, and now it will rebuild in release mode. It's going to do exactly the same thing, compile all the code, but it's going to do some more processing on it to make it run faster. And again, the trade-off is just whether you want it to run faster and perform better or whether you want it to be easier to debug. So there's trade-offs between the two. That's it for downloading the code and getting it compiled. The next thing we need to do is flash it onto the microcontroller board. But before we do that, let's take a look at the configuration file. Now, configuration.h, like you see in many Arduino projects, contains settings that control how the firmware interacts with your hardware, in this case with your stepper motor and your encoder. So the first few settings in this file are just about timing, 5 microsecond stepper cycle, UIA refresh rate, how often we calculate the RPM, stuff about the clock. You don't need to worry about any of that stuff. The first thing here that you might want to look at is the stepper driver configuration. 
Now this is set by default for a stepper resolution of 200 steps per revolution and eight micro steps per step in the stepper driver. This is very typical and this is what I would generally recommend if you're using a stepper motor. I'm not using a stepper motor, I'm using a servo. It doesn't use micro steps, so I will set micro steps to one and the servo resolution is 1000 steps per revolution. So I'll just change that number to 1000. The next thing here is the encoder configuration. Now I'm using what's called a 1024 line encoder, which means it has 1024 lines per revolution on the optical disc inside. But because of the way the quadrature count works, you get four counts per line on the optical disc. So the resolution ends up being 4096 counts per revolution. And if your encoder is different, you'll need to change this number. Next is the lead screw. Right now, the firmware is set up to use Imperial lead screws. Uh, in the future, I'll support metric lead screws, but right now you can cut both Imperial and metric threads using an Imperial lead screw. Mine is 12 threads per inch. So that's what I have this set to, 12 TPI. If yours is eight, change this to eight. If you have something else, you can change it to that. And again, support for an actual metric, like a millimeter pitch lead screw is coming in the future. There's a define here to say whether to use floating point calculations. There was a bunch of uh, discussion in the comments of a previous video about whether floating point, using floating point is a good idea. I designed it for that. I chose this microcontroller for it. I recommend you use floating point. If you really have a problem with that, you can comment this out and we'll use whole number arithmetic. The last section you may want to look at here are some definitions to invert the various control pins. I've got one for the step pin, the direction pin, the enable pin, and the alarm pin. Now for my particular servo driver, the step pin and the direction pin, or at least the input LEDs on the optocouplers are positive logic, meaning they are on to indicate step and it's on to indicate forward direction. Uh, but for the enable pin, it's active low. So I need to turn it off to enable the uh, servo driver. So I've defined invert enable pin, but I've commented out the other two. If you need to invert your step pin, just delete the slashes so that that's no longer commented out. But I will leave it because that's what I need. Now to program the microcontroller, we just have to connect it via USB. So the first thing I'll do is just plug in the power I do not have the other end of the USB cable connected. Now in this case, you can see that there are no LEDs down here in the isolated corner where the USB interface is. That's because I have the power jumpers disconnected electrically, so no power is flowing to the USB. When I plug the USB cable into the computer here on the other end, that light comes on. So now the board is powered and the USB is powered so I can start talking to the debug probe and loading code onto the board. Now we talked about the different configurations a moment ago, the release versus debug. I'm gonna start with debug. There is one other difference here that I hadn't mentioned and that is that when you program the board in debug mode, it puts the code just into RAM. It just goes into the volatile memory of the microcontroller. It does not write it to the flash. So if we program in debug mode, it doesn't disturb the flash, whatever code was already on the board. It just leaves it, but it runs the new code in RAM over the top. And when you turn off the power, it goes back to the old programming. And this is really handy if you want to debug quickly without messing up what was already on the board. So there are standalone tools to do the flashing. I'm not gonna use any of those. I'm just gonna use the debugger that's built into Code Composer Studio. So now that I've selected the debug configuration, which is what I want, I'll come over here and there's a little bug icon that's for the debugger. I will click it. It will go to the debug view and it will pop up here and very quickly write the firmware to the device. That's all it takes. And now it has stopped at a breakpoint at the beginning of main. It always does this when you start in the debugger. The code is not running yet. It's just loaded and it's ready to run and it stopped at the first instruction. And then I have, to I have to click the resume button to actually start it. And when I click that, you can see the message come up on the control panel and the code is running. So once we've gone through, you see the version number 1003 and I can toggle the feeds up and down and switch modes and everything is running. 
Now, because I did this in debug mode, the code is only running in memory. So if I unplug the power and then plug it back in, there's nothing you see on the control panel because there was no code permanently written to the, uh, to the, the chip on the board. Um, it wasn't flashed and so it's gone. If I want it to be written permanently, I switch to release mode and then go ahead and click the debug button. And this time it will flash it into the flash on the board. So this takes longer. When it pops up, the first thing it will do is erase the flash and that takes a little while. And then once it's flashed, now it'll actually erase. Now it'll actually write to the flash, which also takes a moment. And we've done the same thing. We're starting up at the beginning of main and we're stopped at a breakpoint. I can click resume and you can see that the control panel is showing data. I see the version number and we're running just like before. The difference in this case though, is that if I cycle the power by unplugging and then plugging back in, you can see immediately comes up and starts running. And that's because the code is actually in the flash on the microcontroller and it's persistent. In fact, I can unplug the USB cable. So now this is completely standalone. Plug in the power and it runs. Now you can see that when I unplugged the USB, I got an error down here from IcePick telling me I got an invalid response from the XDS-110. That's the debugging hardware that's on this board. And that's just because I unplugged without stopping the debugger. Normally you would stop the debugger by clicking on the little red box up here, which says terminate. And that takes us out of debug mode and back to editing code. This board is now programmed. It has the code on the flash. It's running standalone and we're ready to take this out and put it in the lathe. That's it for today. I do want you to know, I do see your comments. I do see the number of people that are asking about a kit. I am still planning on making the interface PC board available, though technically you don't need one. This project is designed specifically to use all off the shelf parts and to be maker friendly. So from the information that's available in these videos and on the GitHub project, you could just go out and build one yourself. However, if you would like the interface PC board to make the installation cleaner, I am planning on making that available. I am taking my time on it because I wanna make sure the hardware is good before I start taking other people's money and making lots of them and sending them off into the world. So you can look for that coming up in the future. In the meantime, if you are enjoying these videos, please give me a thumbs up. Feel free to subscribe to the channel and leave me a comment. I'd like to know what you think. Thank you for watching.